All right, well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Elk Grove Church of Christ. It is another beautiful sunny day here in Elk Grove, and we're just thankful that you found us, that you are joining us each and every week online. And and like we say, you know, if you're watching us right now, you have time to get to uh, outdoor service if you want to. That starts at 1130, right behind our building, uh, 2601 West Tarrant Court in Elk Grove, California. So come join us. We'd love to see your faces, uh, but we're also glad that you're here joining us this way. And so... We hope you have a blessed and awesome worship as we open up God's Word, share a time of communion, a song, and uh, I just hope that our hearts are open to receive that. So let's have a blessed worship, everybody. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. Won't you please join me in a word of prayer? Holy Father in heaven, we come this morning with thanksgiving in our hearts, Father, for your love that you have shown upon us. You've sent us your precious Son, whose precious blood has redeemed us from our sins, made us holy and acceptable in your sight. We thank you, Father, for such great love. We thank you, Father, for us being in this day and age where we can take advantage of technology to come together with one another, even though we are physically apart. We pray, Father, that you will bless those who, or who lead us, or lead our congregation, for they labor hard on our behalf in the kingdom of your dear Son. May we always follow and seek to follow truth, for our Lord is the way, the truth, and the life. Yet, in the reality, we know that there is a way. It seems right unto a man, but the end thereof leads to destruction. Therefore, we pray even more that you will bless us and guide us, that we will always follow your precious Son, for he is the way, the truth, and the life. Be with us today as we go through this service, that we will be edified and seek new ways to live for you in a way that is pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. I will be reading Psalm 25, 4 through 5. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of the Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. Heroes and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me. All my fears and failures fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, heroes and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see, we're singing for the glory of the risen King, Jesus, shine your 
shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, heroes and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, heroes and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Hello, church family. This portion of our worship service has been set aside for us to prepare to commune with our Lord and Savior and with one another. And in doing so, I have a few words of inspiration from one of my favorite sources, OurDailyBread.com. This short article is based upon Psalm 37, verses 1 through 7, as an, and is entitled, The Ticking Watch. And it reads as follows. A group of workers were cutting ice out of a frozen lake and storing it in an ice house when one of them realized he lost his watch in the windowless building. He and his friends searched for it in vain. After they gave up, a young boy who'd seen them exit went into the building. Soon he emerged with the watch. Asked how he found it, he replied, I just sat down and kept quiet and soon I could hear it ticking. The Bible tells us much about the value of being still. No wonder, for God sometimes speaks in a whisper. In the busyness of life, it can be hard to hear him. But if we stop rushing about and spend some quiet time with him and the scriptures, we may hear his gentle voice in our thoughts. Psalm 37, one through seven, assures us that we can trust God to rescue us from the wicked schemes of evil people. Give us refuge and help us stay faithful. But how can we do this when turmoil is all around us? Verse seven suggests, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. We could start by learning to keep silent for a few minutes after prayer or by quietly reading the Bible and letting the words soak into our hearts. And then, perhaps, we'll hear his wisdom speaking to us, quiet and steady, as a ticking watch. Join me as we give thanks for the bread and for the cup. Heavenly Father, as we eat this bread and drink from the cup to remember the sacrifice Jesus made for us and the promise Jesus made to us, that he will be with us in every step we take and in everything we do to spread the gospel message of salvation to the lost so that they too can live with him in eternity. Father, for everything that is said and for all blessings you receive, we give you alone all the praise and all the glory and all the honor in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. In his name we offer this prayer. Amen. Enjoy the worship service, everyone. All right, well, good morning again, everybody. My name is Gavin Crutcher, and I'm the minister here at the Elk Grove Church of Christ. And today we're going to be continuing in our series, uh, Beauty for Ashes. And I wanted to talk about uh, Palm Sunday. Today is Palm Sunday. This is like... Jesus's entrance as king into Jerusalem but he doesn't do this 
in the way in which we all expect. And so we're going to kind of talk about that. We're going to uh, look at what is what did it mean for Jesus to enter into Jerusalem the way that he did? What were people's expectations? How does that fit in with our theme of beauty for ashes? And so I think one of the most important things is just we're just going to look at this very beginning before Jesus clears out the temple uh, uh, money changers and all that. We're going to see Jesus entry into Jerusalem. Before he gets there, they're sitting at the Mount of Olives. This is in Matthew chapter 21. So you should go and you should read this. Um, I'll be paraphrasing down through, but you should always read your Bibles. Come back to me if you feel like there's anything different or or if it affirms it, that's always good too. Um, so they're sitting at the Mount of Olives and he looks at his disciples. He sends two of them out to go get a donkey for him. And I think uh, it just initially that statement may seem like normal. Like, yeah, I mean, they should go and do that. But I think the disciples at this point um, might have felt that that was an act of some subsur- some subservient person should have done that, right? Like if you're at a job, the, that's like the intern who works for you. You say, hey, I, you know, I'd really like a cup of coffee. Why don't you go get me a cup of coffee? At least that's what the movies look like. I've never had an intern that's worked under me like that, so I don't know what that looks like. I get myself my own coffee. Um, but, you know, he says, go. Jesus has given these guys all of the authority that's with them. They've watched him do things. They've seen all this miraculous stuff. They themselves were given the ability to do miraculous things as well. And and maybe if Jesus was like, hey, I want you to go down and prime the pump of, of Jerusalem for me. Let them know I'm coming. Speak the good word that you've learned through me. Go and heal some people. Let them know that this is coming through me. But instead he says, I need you to go get me a donkey. And they might have been a little confused because he has to explain it to him. He says, I want you to go. There's going to be a donkey tied up with his foal. And, and I, I want you to untie them and bring them back. If anybody questions you about this, say the Lord needs them. They're going to send it to you immediately. That's the second verse, uh, Matthew 21. And so they go and they do that. And they lay their coats on it. And Jesus gets on it and starts to make his entrance. So Jesus is not entering the way that you would assume a king would enter. A king would enter like Pilate did before him. So it's, it says that Pilate kind of came into Jerusalem during this time of Passover on a horse. Uh, and, and probably had chariots next to him and all of these big things to let him tell the story to Jerusalem that I am your ruler. I am in charge here. I am important. Nobody else. That's what people who are important are. Back then they would ride in on a horse. Jesus probably deserved to ride on a horse, but he's fulfilling what God had already planned from the beginning. Daniel's kind of talked about this uh, entrance into uh, Jerusalem that Jesus was going to do and it, it made the statement that it was going to be like within I don't remember 178,000 years or something like that or, or I don't even remember I have to look back in that uh, or days I guess 170,000 days years would be a long time 170,000 days or something like that um, to show that Jesus this Jesus was going to come in and all these things were going to happen uh, Zechariah made this prophetic statement that the Messiah was going to come in on full of a donkey and Jesus does this to fulfill this prophecy but he also does it to show that he's coming in as a servant he wants his disciples to know what it means to follow him is to be a servant to come in to serve others to be humble to come in with humility to do the things that God has called him to do so Jesus doesn't come in with the pomp and circumstance that a, a pilot would come in. He comes in more in a subservient role. And I think that's where things started to change because as Jesus comes in, people are laying down their coats on the road. They're laying down palm leaves and they're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. People are expecting a king that is going to free them from the, this Roman rule and, and create this new uh, Israel that's going to be dominant again like David. They're going to bring back in this David type uh, Messiah was going to be like that. But Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus comes in and starts to change what that looks like. I'm going to come in on a donkey. We're going to learn to serve. You're going to follow me. I'm going to clear out the things that people want which is fame or attention or being the center of it all and instead Jesus doesn't doesn't come in to be the center of it all he comes in to give God the glory to be the center stage to know that he comes for something bigger that Jesus was going to come in as a king but he was going to leave on a cross taking the death of a criminal for the sake of all of us that we may have 
this life. And so when you start to think about what that looks like and, and how that had to be, because if you're a follower of Jesus at that time, you're probably hoping that this is the moment where he's going to show his dominance and we're going to no longer have to worry about all these people who are trying to take advantage of us or take us over. But instead, you're actually called to endure that even more to serve just like he did even more and people don't really like a servant as much as they like a king they look down on a servant they look up to a king but jesus was going to show us that being a king that god had for us from the beginning of it all was to look like a servant he's going to go through a really rough week where he's going to see great crowds that are in his favor uh, slowly start to disappear slowly start to dwindle because they start to read the writing on the wall that shows that life is now going to be different that it's not what they expected and so not everybody was keen on that teachers of the law didn't like that he was coming in and changing their whole status quo he would start to call them hypocrites he would start to uh, call them whitewashed tombs and uh, i mean every word that would be so hard to hear if you were this important leader of of the Jews as a teacher of the law to hear and he he's taking out the money that they were getting by cracking a whip and shooing people out of the temple courts because they were taking advantage of people and taking their money he was just starting to flip everything upside down to let us know that what we were expecting is not going to be because what God had for us was somebody who's going to come and take all of our sin and put it on a cross that the glory was going to come from redemption and reconciliation. It wasn't going to come from authority being put all over people on an earthly term that goes away. It was going to establish a kingdom that was going to last forever. And he's teaching his disciples during this time that you are going to be following a suffering savior. That though we're entering now as, as crowds are yelling, Hosanna in the highest, that what is before us is going to be some destruction, some pain. There's going to be suffering for what it means to serve God and to follow him. Jesus chooses to suffer that we may have life. He chooses to go through and to, to set things right, to establish the kingdom of God here as the church. But it doesn't establish the church that we may be pumped up and be the center stage to to hold the authority over people. He came so that we could serve as he served, to love as he loved, to give hope as he gave hope. Now, some people say that uh, the crowds that were yelling Hosanna weren't the same crowds that were yelling crucify him later. Before Jesus would, you know, during that whole Passover time, said that there'd be like 2.5 million people there come from all over the world to come into Passover. It's one of the biggest times of the Jewish calendar uh, celebrations. And, and they said that Jesus probably hung out in a different side where most Galileans hung out with. And that's where he did most of his work with. He hung out with those that were on the margins. And, and some people think that the people who were yelling Hosanna and the highest might have been that group. And they may not have been the same group that was yelling crucify him later. Who are the people who were in town center who were the more elite, the more, um, you know, Pharisees and teachers of the law and different things like that, that were following them. And I don't know. It could be both, but I could say this. I'm sure for myself, if I was there and expecting something out of Jesus and, and I saw something different, I think I don't know how I would how I would take that. I'd have to really sit and to think on that and to let let God's truth sink into me. Because, you know, on the outside, a lot of people's hope is that we are now serving someone who's gonna bring us up, that lifts us out of all this. If you've ever grew up in a poor neighborhood, we all like cling to the people who made it out and did really big things for them. So if you ever had somebody that grew up in your neighborhood and it was kind of like on the outskirts, like the bad, maybe the bad neighborhoods or whatever, and they made it into a pro sport or they became famous or they became really well to do entrepreneurs or whatever, you celebrate them like, look at them, they made it out. They're, you know, they're representing us and we're coming out. And I, I could just, I could see many of them thinking that for Jesus. He's one of us. Look at him. He's now the king. They're laying down their coats and yeah, Hosanna, God is bringing him here. But when they start to see that he's not overthrowing those teachers of the law that were oppressing or the Romans who were oppressing or whatever it was, oh, that could hurt, that could sting a little bit. I was expecting something and I got something different. But Jesus, 
his whole mode coming in was to I don't know I mean to to follow God's plan for him and part of that plan was to come in king on a donkey to leave king of Jews above his head on a cross to give hope to all of us that life isn't over just because we're not getting what we expect but at the end of it we have a promise of hope that Jesus is Lord that a tomb is empty that's what will be next week the hope of being a servant to look out for those who are on the margins to take care of those who need help to give hope to those who are hopeless to forgive those who may think that they're unforgivable to love the unlovable and this is where God has called us to be to follow a suffering servant a suffering savior for us to pick up our cross too to walk with him in step that others may know of life through him because he is our savior and God is so good that he gives us hope in Jesus our king that we yell Hosanna and, and when all of this is over every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that he is Lord the ones who yelled Hosanna in the highest king our Messiah is here to the ones who yelled crucify him we're all going to get on a knee we're all going to bow and we're all going to confess that he is Lord and our hope is that we can follow in his footsteps and learn that being one of his disciples is to be a servant to share this love to share this hope with others let's go to god in prayer dear father Lord, you're an amazing and awesome god and we fall short so often and we have these weird expectations of the things that you might do in our lives that we know you are with us when we feel prosperity or we feel like we're important or whatever it is and god i think we find you most when we come before you with humility so help us help us god with your holy spirit that is inside of us to be humbled to be your servants to follow in your footsteps even if those footsteps lead us to some suffering and a cross that we need to bear that we may have life with you eternal god we're so grateful for your love and for your forgiveness and we pray all these things in your son's name amen each and every week we, we give an invitation for those who might be thinking about what it means to be um, part of the family, um, part of God's inheritance, right? Um, we believe that accepting Christ as your Savior and baptism is, is that step, that as you accept him, no matter where you are, you don't have to have it all figured out, you don't have to be perfect, but knowing that God has forgiven you already because he sent a Messiah for you, he sent Jesus to take your sins and put them on a cross. That this is your beginning stage, not your ending stage. That, that baptism leads us to a start, a new beginning, to learn and to grow and to walk in the steps that Jesus has for us. Just like they're doing as they walk into uh, Jerusalem as its king and the disciples are following, they're still learning. They're still learning how to serve. They're still learning what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. They're still learning what it means to not have it all figured out. And we're there too. So we want to offer that. If you want to take on Christ in baptism, we would love to help you get on that journey. Just leave me a comment. Or reach out. Our email's out there. My, my phone number and things for the church is on our website and on Facebook. You can always reach out. We'd love to help you uh, get there on your journey. If you're looking for a church that you want to be a part of uh, and you don't have one and you just found us online, you're in the area, we'd love to have you. Um, just come and, and we'll, we'll talk with you about what that looks like. So we hope you have a great week. Um, it's amazing that we're leading up to Easter and I am I am so excited because there's nothing more fun to do than to preach on a savior that can conquer death, a tomb that is empty. So we hope you join us next week. All right, have a great week everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of
Shining 